finish our Missions Emphasis Month, this is the last of the sermons that I'll be speaking topically on what is the Great Commission and how we as a church are involved in that. We have been learning about that over the last four weeks. Today we finish in John chapter 20. So if you please have your Bibles, please turn with me to John chapter 20. Please stand with me as we read these verses out of respect to God's Word. John chapter 20, we'll be reading from verse 19 to verse 23. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Father, we pray for your help this morning as we study your word. Thank you for the privilege we have had already to sing your word, to read your word. But we pray for your spirit's help now as we study your word. May none of the words, your words, fall to the ground this morning. We pray, Lord, the meditations of our hearts and the words that I speak today may be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Please be seated. So before we jump into this passage this morning, let me give you some background and context first. So here at the end of the Gospel of John, Jesus has already been crucified. Um, His awful trial and his subsequent torture and death have already happened. And in our passage here in chapter 20, it's Resurrection Sunday, and it has been an awful Um, eventful day for everyone involved. The Romans, remember, had crucified Jesus. They were in a panic because they couldn't find his body, and the disciples were in hiding, as we see in our passage. And here in our passage, the disciples and others were, were huddled together in a room, it says, meeting behind locked doors. And these men were hiding behind these locked doors because of fear of the the Roman and Jewish leaders who had just crucified Jesus. And it was, it was not far-fetched to think that they might be next if they were caught. And they may have been discussing how they could sneak out of Jerusalem without being arrested. And of course, rumor had it that the Jewish leaders wanted to arrest and they wanted to dispose of anyone who had been associated with Jesus. So in our text, We see the disciples afraid. So look at verse 19 and 20. My very first point is that the Lord accepts us. The Lord accepts us. In John 20 verse 19, the verse tells us, On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you you. So without warning, the scriptures say, suddenly the Lord just appears and he says in verse 19, peace be with you. Now that phrase, peace be with you, was a, was a common Jewish greeting. It was a, an overall uh, warm greeting of, of well-being on the other person's part. But in the context here, it means far more than just this gesture. It means much more than that. I don't imagine those were the words some of the disciples were expecting to hear either. Keep in mind that these are men who had all fled. They had all fled for their lives when Jesus was arrested. Remember, Peter had denied the Lord Jesus three times. Um, In the Gospel of Luke, the, the writer there tells us they had all doubted the initial reports of the the resurrection of Jesus. 
So I think it would be understandable if Jesus had even greeted them differently, maybe in a, in, in a harsher way. Maybe if the Lord had said to them, you, you unbelieving, um, thick-headed excuses for uh, disciples, when are you going to get it all together? Maybe he could have said that. But rather than rebuking them, the Lord graciously emphasizes and extends his peace towards them. There is no rebuke. There are no words. Well, how could have you done that? Why? Why did you deny me? Jesus doesn't scold them and Jesus doesn't, he doesn't shame them. The first words out of his mouth show us one very important thing, that he accepted them, that he accepted them. And I hope you can imagine the relief here, the relief and the joy that they must have felt that flooded into their hearts when Jesus spoke these words. These first words of Jesus after his resurrection were almost identical to what he said shortly before he was arrested in John chapter 16. Look quickly, turn with me to John chapter 16. Jesus says to them in verse 33, John 16, 33, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The disciples were afraid, and the word fear that's used in verse 19 carries with it the idea of flight, the idea of, of flight. The disciples were alarmed, the disciples were, were frightened, and they wanted to flee, they wanted to, to bolt, they wanted to, to get out of there. The Gospel of Luke in chapter 24 says that they were frightened, it says that they thought that they were even seeing a ghost. And now contra, contrast that with these, these words that we are looking at here in, in chapter 19, in, in chapter 20, verse 19, the word peace. The word peace, very different from the word fear. And the word peace is defined as putting together that which is broken. Putting together that which is broken. Jesus knows they are afraid, and he says to them, shalom, which was the word for peace. Which, which literally means all, all good to you. And we see what happens here, the outcome. In verse 20, the report is given of the outcome. Jesus showed them his hands. He showed them his, his side. Look at verse 20. It says, the disciples were glad. They rejoiced when they saw that it was the Lord. They rejoiced. The peace with, peace with God is is foundational for our, our joy. And in our context this morning, in an application which I think we need to think about, if we are going to be effective for our Lord in this mission that He's given to us in making disciples, we need to be filled with joy. We need to be people who have peace with God. If we do not have peace with God, we will not be able to fulfill the mission that the Lord has given to us. We cannot begin to serve the Lord unless you are first reconciled to Him through the peace that Christ accomplished on the cross. In Romans chapter 8, verse 7 and 8 tells us that before we believe in Christ, our sins have alienated us from God. But when we trust in Christ, we enter into a new relationship of peace with God. Now maybe... You've come from a Christian family and you've been brought up in a Christian church your whole life. And maybe that's difficult for you, to, for you to understand. How am I alienated to God? How am I an alien from God? I've known God my whole life. I've been brought up in a Christian family. How can you say that I am an alien from God? How am I alienated from God? Well, the problem is that we have been born into sin. And that is what has alienated us from a relationship with the Lord, just as Romans 8, verse 7 and 8 tells us. Our sins have alienated us from God. We are, uh, the enemy is sin. The, the enemy is not each other. The enemy is sin. But when we trust in Christ and we ask for the forgiveness of our sins, we can enter into a new relationship with the Lord, a, re a relationship of peace. 
He's no longer our, uh, we are no longer God's enemies. We are embraced as his, his children. And we become his ambassadors on this earth. We become his ambassadors on this earth. He gives us a mission to accomplish, to represent him and share about this mission of reconciliation with a world that is hostile to this message. And not only does Christ give us peace with, with him, peace with God through his blood, but he also gives us the peace of God. And that's important, not just peace with God, but the peace of God that we need in order to have fruitful relationships with each other. The peace of God that passes all understanding is necessary for us to, to live lives that make sense as we seek to accomplish His mission, as we abide in His presence in difficult circumstances, as we abide in His presence when times are tough and the world watches us and how we respond and how we represent Christ in those difficult times. If we do not have peace with God, we won't have the peace of God that passes all understanding. Jesus concluded the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verse 20. He gave this assurance. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that's the promise of peace that we have because God is with His children. Because God is with His children. And I'm sure you've experienced hostile people in your workplace, especially when it comes to the gospel. People who aren't interested in hearing about this message of, of peace. But as we proclaim this gospel, nevertheless, to this hostile world, the Lord's presence is with us. And this peace of God, which passes all understanding, helps us to share Christ in difficult circumstances. As we've been learning throughout this month. But here's the question. Here's a question that I think we all need to ask ourselves. How is it then? Why do we continue to cower in the corner when the Savior wants to embrace us? Why do we try to lock Him out of our lives when He offers us His peace? And as it relates to our mission that the Lord gives us, Jesus knows that fear is keep many of us from sharing the good news. And we are ruled by fear rather than by peace when it comes to the Great Commission. By granting peace, Jesus shows how much that He accepts us. And we have nothing to be afraid of. Christ has given us peace with God. He's given us the peace of God and He's given us peace with one another as a result so that we can carry out his mission on this earth. But secondly, look at verse 21. He commissions us. He commissions us. Look at verse 21. Jesus says to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. I remember a story I heard once from a friend who had just got his driver's license and he reached home excited and as soon as he entered the living room, his father was there. His father was standing there with the car keys and he tossed the car keys to him for the first time. And he said it was his dad's way of saying, son, I trust you. Take the car and be careful and have some fun. And unfortunately, that wasn't the end of the story. He had to give those same keys back to his father a year later when he lost his license because of a couple of speeding tickets. But Jesus does something similar here with his followers when he says in verse 21, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. So if you will, Jesus is, is tossing the disciples the keys to the car here. He's trusting them. He not only accepts them, but he is trusting them with the message of the gospel. And he believes in them. And as a result, he commissions them. And some people argue that the commission given to us in Matthew 28 is only for, for the disciples of Jesus at that point. 
Well, let me counter-argue that argument right here. The Great Commission is summed up for us here in our passage, in verse 21, right here, where Jesus says, As the Father has sent me, I also am sending you. He's not just speaking to his 11 disciples in this room. He's talking to everyone that is in that room. There were, there were women in that room. There were other disciples as well in that room. And he's talking to us who, are, who weren't in that room 2,000 years ago. Listen to how Paul states our mission. Turn to 2 Corinthians quickly. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. The scripture says, He has committed to us the message of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Again, the Great Commission summarized for us. When we've been accepted by Christ, it's not just so that we can sit around and do nothing. We've been accepted not just so we can bask in our relationship with him, but so that we can live out our purpose. And the purpose the Lord has given to us is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We've been commissioned with a task. We've been commissioned with a task. But maybe at this point you still have some reservations. Maybe at this point you're saying, Pastor, how can I possibly go out into this world just as the Father sent Jesus into the world? Number one, I'm not Jesus. Jesus was God in human flesh. I am not. Jesus never sinned. I often sin. Jesus had supernatural abilities. I don't have those abilities. Jesus walked in unbroken, intimate fellowship with the Father. I, I don't. Jesus never made mistakes. I make mistakes all the time. How can you say, I must go as Jesus went? Well, don't worry, you're not in that boat alone. The Apostle Paul himself had reservations. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, Who is adequate for these things? Who is adequate for these things? I often feel like the Apostle Paul. I had the same doubts. But Paul then answers this question and these doubts about feelings of inadequacy with this explanation. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians and, and underline this passage. Very, very encouraging passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 5, the apostle Paul says, Not that we are sufficient, in other words, adequate. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us but what does he say our sufficiency is from god our sufficiency is from god underline that folks our lord has accepted us and he commissions us because he knows it is possible he knows what we can do if we trust in him through that relationship that has been reconciled because of his son. Our Lord turns what we think is impossible into mission possible. Which leads to my third point. Look at verse 22. Here, he equips us for this mission. He equips us for this mission. I'm not just talking to people who want to be missionaries today. I'm talking to every single one of us who are Christians. Every single one of us who are disciples of Christ. He equips us to be these faithful witnesses that he has asked us to be. Look at verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus doesn't just entrust us with the responsibility of proclaiming the gospel to others. 
He equips us for this important job. At this moment of greatest need, the Savior promises to place His Spirit in each of us individually. So remember back in, in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 happened shortly after, John chapter 20, just before Jesus ascended up into heaven. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8 to His disciples, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witness both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth. And here, Jesus is directly linking the power of the coming Spirit to the disciples who will be witnessing to Him in the future. The Bible you know, never commands us to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Let me just say that clearly. The Bible never commands us to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We are baptized once at a, when, we are, when we are saved. We are baptized with the Holy Spirit when we are saved. But the, the Bible does command us to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. That is a command. We are to walk in the Spirit. That's something we need to be doing on an ongoing basis. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, don't be foolish, be wise, know what the will of the Lord is. And it tells us there, the will of the Lord is to be filled with the Spirit. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Be filled with the Spirit. The risen Savior has equipped us in order to proclaim and to fulfill His mission. We are not left alone. He has provided the help that we need. And can I say that again? We are not left alone. He has provided the help that we need. There's a story I heard about a young mother wishing to encourage her son's progress on the piano. And the mother took her boy to a Paderewski concert, a very famous pianist. And after they were seated, the mother spotted a, a friend in the audience and she walked down the aisle to, to greet her friend. And of course, the little boy, seizing the opportunity to explore this wonderful concert hall, the little boy, he, he rose up and he went through a door that said, no admittance. And when the house lights dimmed and the concert was about to begin, the mother returned to her seat and discovered that her son was, was missing. And then suddenly the, the curtains parted and the, the spotlight focused on the impressive Stainway piano that was there on the stage. And in horror, the mother saw her little boy seated at the keyboard, innocently picking out twinkle, twinkle, little star. And at the moment, the great piano master made his entrance and quickly moved to the piano, and he whispered in the boy's ear, don't quit, keep playing. And then leaning over the little boy, Paderewski, he reached down with his left hand, and he began filling in the bass part. And soon his right arm reached around to the other side of the child, and he, he added a, a running obligato. You know what that is, eh, Morelis? Can explain to me later. <laughs> and together, the old master and this young novice transformed a, a frightening situation into a, a wonderfully creative experience. And the, the audience was mesmerized. And that's the way it is with the Holy Spirit. And what we can accomplish on our own is, is hardly noticeable, isn't it? We try our best, but the results are are often ungraceful. They are like this terrible music, very basic. But with the hand of the master, our life's work can be beautiful. It can be beautiful. And folks, we've been accepted, we've been commissioned, and we've been equipped to play this beautiful music of salvation for those who are lost in their sins. And he's whispering to us today, don't quit. 
The Holy Spirit is encouraging us. Keep playing. We need to trust Him and feel His loving arms around us. I know that the, the strong hands are playing this concert for us. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And we saw that the Lord accepts us. He commissions us. He equips us. And then lastly, in verse 23, He motivates us. And the last verse of our text adds one final thing. Look at verse 23. It tells us, <coughs> excuse me, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, the Roman Catholic Church teaches a very different understanding from this verse. They teach that this verse, from this verse, that only ordained priests have the authority to forgive sins. And only when members come to confession, they can get their sins forgiven. This is a wrong interpretation of this verse. There is no example in the Bible of the apostles forgiving or retaining the sins of anyone. That's not what the verse is saying. Comparing Scripture with Scripture, we see in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, that all believers are priests before God. We see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, that Jesus is the only mediator. And most important, only God can forgive sins, which He does the instant a person repents and believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And to add penance, as the Roman Catholic Church teach, as a necessary um, ritual for forgiveness, is, is adding works to the finished work of Christ on the cross which is unnecessary, which is unbiblical. God does not forgive people's sins because we decide to forgive them. And He doesn't withhold forgiveness because we withhold forgiveness. And rather, those who proclaim the gospel are in effect forgiving or not forgiving sins, depending on whether the hearers accept or reject Jesus Christ. So if you tell people about this forgiveness, you are extending forgiveness to them on behalf of Christ. If they respond, they are forgiven, as the Scriptures tell us. If they, if they don't accept this offer, they are not forgiven, as the Scriptures tell us. And so the meaning and application for us is that we have this authority from the Scriptures to be ambassadors of Christ, to represent Christ and to remind people that if they repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ, their sins will be forgiven. For sure. A hundred percent guaranteed. Not just a hope. They will be forgiven. And of course, the other side of the coin is also true. If a person hardens his heart and refuses to believe the gospel, we can say very emphatically that the Scriptures tell them that their sins are still unforgiven. So Jesus accepts us, He commissions us, and He equips us, and he, he motivates us. What do I mean by that? Well, the motivation is that the world is desperately in need of this message of forgiveness. If we do not go forward, some will never hear that they can be set free. Some will never know the joy of salvation. They will be trapped in their sins. Some will never know of the Spirit's strength in difficult times. They will never know of this peace that passes all understanding. If we don't tell the people we come in contact with about this gospel, we're not living the mission and calling that the Lord has called us to. This very important message of reconciliation and his peace and his proof shows how much that he accepts us and we've been accepted not so we can just bask in our relationship with him but so that we can live out our purpose so that we can live out our purpose so that we can fulfill this mission that the lord has given to us I want to conclude this morning with a personal story. I may have shared this story a few years ago. 
And while we lived in India, I was invited to preach at a church that was on the campus of an old Christian mission hospital. And the hospital was struggling along, and many of the members were employed at this hospital. And it was in this church that I met Amol. Amol was a 10-year-old boy who had been found abandoned at the near, near, nearby uh, railway station. He was only three years old when one of the, the church members found him begging for food at the railway station. And this lady gave Amol some biscuits from a handbag and invited him home for a hot meal. And Amol was weak. He was sickly. And this church member, this lady, called the pastor of the church to see how they could help Amol. And the church members went to the police. They reported a, a lost and a missing child. And the, the, the church never stopped looking for his parents. But it became clear to everyone that Amol had been abandoned by his parents at this major railway junction. And the members cared for Amol. And they took him for medical checkups because he was so sickly. And they eventually discovered that Amol had HIV contracted through his mom at birth. And Kerry and I met Amol seven years later. He was 10 years old. He had been taking his medication, and the church was loving him as one of their own. And Kerry and I had the privilege of getting to know Amol over the three years that I was ministering at this church. And the church was very intentional about his physical health because he had HIV, but also they were very intentional about sharing the gospel with him. And this church invested their lives into Amol, even though he was first a stranger to them. And they invested their time. They invested their, their resources, and they invested the gospel into his life, even though he was probably a discarded child of a prostitute. And Amol was 13 years old when he died. His funeral was something that, that I will never forget. But during those 10 years, the Lord gave Amol to this church. They were faithful with the purpose that God had entrusted with him. And they were faithful in making Amol a follower of Jesus. And the church gave me Amol's Bible. It was a small New Testament Gideon Bible that was underlined with all of the notes that he had taken from sermons and from Bible studies that he had attended. And I'd done a sermon series to the Gospel of John. And of course, I was drawn to the passages that he had underlined in the Gospel of John. And one of those passages was John chapter 16, verse 33, where Jesus says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And next to this verse, this 13-year-old boy wrote in the margin, thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. In him, we have peace. And I have confidence that one day I will see him all again in heaven and I will have the privilege of worshiping Jesus with him because this church was faithful. Because this church was faithful with the mission to proclaim the forgiveness of sins to this marginalized little boy in Jesus' name and to all who will believe. New Life Church, let's not forget our mission that the Lord has given to us. And we've been reminded this whole month of what our, what our duty is, what our privilege is. And there are people all around us lost and dying in their sin. And the Lord has saved us from darkness. And He has brought us into His marvelous light for a reason. He has given us a purpose. He has equipped us so that we can fulfill this purpose. He has accepted us so that we will make disciples of Him to the world around us dying in their sins. 
This mission is possible because the risen Savior has made it possible for us. We've been accepted not just so that we can sit around and bask in our relationship with Him, but so that we can live out our purpose. We've been commissioned to proclaim a great message. And Jesus says to us all this morning, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Father, we thank you today for the wonderful gospel, the gospel of grace that has saved sinners like us who don't deserve your grace, who were once your enemies but are now seated at your table. Thank you for your grace. Help us to be faithful in sharing this wonderful message with those who are still lost in their sins. Help us to be faithful to make disciples of our Savior. For your glory, Lord, and for our joy. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen.